Uh, hi, I'm Chris. Uh, there's my contact info if you want to tweet at me. Uh, most people call me fool because I bet there are five other Chris's in the room. And uh, namespace collision is a terrible thing. Um, <clears throat> I work at New Relic, and I'm a team lead on the developer support team. We help people use our software, API, write code to, to leverage their software and ours. Um, and I spend most of my workday doing remote debugging. So a lot of these tips and tricks are from this job and from my career. Um, quick shout out, which I'm only going to do once. Uh, I love my job. My company's hiring like crazy. This guy will vouch that it's not a terrible place to work. He just started a month ago. Um, so uh, if you're smart and nice and looking for a job, feel free to talk to me. I'll be here all week. Uh, our office is in Portland. Uh, so this talk is going to be really slide light. This is slide one of eight. So you won't spend a lot of time staring at the screen. We're going to spend a lot of time talking. Hopefully, you'll spend some time talking to me, too, because I do not have enough material to talk for 45 minutes. But together, we have enough material to talk for days. Uh, so I want to start off uh, by uh, kind of getting the collaborative juices going. Uh, uh, there's more people than I was expecting, so I'm not going to go one by one, but uh, could I get some shows of hands as to how this information is relevant to your workflow, be it employment or you know, life circumstances? How many of you are, are primarily developers by, by job duties? Um, end user support? Any other professions like medical profession, uh, plumber? I mean, there's a lot of other jobs out there that require kind of uh, debugging, troubleshooting, although they may not call it unless, that unless you're an exterminator. But, um, cool. Well, um, as someone who works in tech support, that's, that's my motivation, but uh, a lot of this talk is about how to kind of address your audience and your point of view and kind of define your criteria for success in addition to how to actually do the thing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, no matter what your role is, I assume you're here because you have to solve problems sometimes, and uh, hopefully we can expand your insight on doing so. Um, <clears throat> since I do primarily technical support, I have kind of a different spin on it than you do maybe. Um, and since I do it for developers, I have a different spin on it than someone who's at the other end of the phone on Comcast. It's just like, yes, we know it's not working. Yes, we know it's not working. Um, <clears throat> so um, now we have to talk about goals. Uh, and debugging is, is the thing, but what, what, is it we're trying to, uh, what is it we're trying to solve? Um, I don't really think that tech support is hell, but uh, there's moments of it that are. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, the goal of, of solving the problem versus the goal of giving the actual answer to the unasked question is, is one that I struggle with a lot. Um, <clears throat> uh, I imagine a doctor has an even different perspective on it. Uh, you know, when someone comes in and says, oh, my arm hurts, and he's like, hmm, well, that may be the case, but you seem to be overweight smokers. Maybe you're having a heart attack, and your arm's actually just a symptom and not the cause. So how you, uh, how you get there from here is, is one of the things we'll talk about. Uh, my team debates metrics for success uh, endlessly because we can't decide what the most important thing to measure is we have about eight things that are important. And uh, these may or may not be relevant to you, but some, some things that we've elucidated over, over the years. Um, uh, efficient answers, both in terms of our time and in terms of customers' time. OK, I can, I can help you use the API to, API to solve that problem, but maybe I don't need to because the solution already exists somewhere else to the problem you're actually having that's not about our API. Um, <clears throat> we want to you know, demonstrate concern and interest. Oh, um, you know, I don't understand what you're trying to do. I want to know. I want to build this relationship with you that makes you think, oh, there's a person here who wants to talk to me and isn't just, you know, like, oh, how many of these can I get through in a minute? Uh, <clears throat> that kind of goes alongside with the uh, you know, approachability bedside manner if you're in the medical profession. Uh, of course, problem resolution, uh, that, that being like what they actually pay me to do, solve problems. But um, <clears throat> we find that our kind of uh, customer satisfaction uh, ratings, which is only one metric of success, uh, go up when you are approachable and, and nice and pleasant to work with. And uh, further, when you um, <clears throat> solve a problem that the customer hadn't stated. So hey, I'm trying to you know, do x with your API. It's failing. Right, why are you trying to do x? If, you, if you're actually trying to get this y answer, maybe there's a different way. And hey, maybe I can save you some work and save us some back and forth as you hit all the edge cases that our API wasn't meant to deal with to get down this path that you didn't need to use the API to, to get to anyway. Um, so uh, goals and sub-goals. Deciding that goal uh, beforehand should illuminate both the style and the strategy for debugging and uh, for investigation that leads you up to the debugging. So uh, if you can, make sure that you're trying to solve a well-specified problem before diving in, which, as I said, that's, this is one of my, my big challenges, even as a 20-year IT professional of making sure that I'm actually solving the problem as opposed to somebody's statement of the problem or perception of some other aspect of a thing that is not their problem. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, that, that did transfer across all my career paths from you know, 
you turn off and on again to mentoring students, to uh, you know, designing data centers, and now back to tech support. So uh, in the room, how many people have read um, this uh, talk? Uh, it's How to Ask Smart Questions by Eric Raymond, the guy who wrote Cathedral and the Bazaar. Uh, if you haven't read it, I know it's not as iconic as Cathedral and the Bazaar. It's way shorter, and it has a lot to say uh, about debugging. Uh, it really couches it in terms of, um, hi, I'm a newbie, and I want to know how to ask an intelligent question about your software, oh, open source developer, that I'm asking for help. But uh, we can turn it around, and uh, we, can learn how to, we can learn how to ask good questions as debuggers that uh, will elicit, elicit faster, better answers. Uh, whether debugging your own code or, or trying to talk to someone in Antarctica through a surgical procedure. If you ask smarter questions, you'll get more relevant answers. So uh, some of the most relevant points from, uh, from this doc, like we'll talk about this for about 10 minutes before I uh, open it up to uh, kind of more discussion. Uh, <clears throat> first off, uh, state your suppositions. If I think you're working uh, with our Java SDK and I write you some Java code, I spend 30 minutes spinning it up and and you say, hey, that's great, but actually I'm working in Ruby, then I've just wasted my time and given you a, a subpar answer. So state up front, hey, I, I think you're trying to use the, the API with Java, and um, you know, let's make sure that you're trying to do this on a supported platform, that you have an internet connection, you know, all these prerequisites for successful uh, termination. Uh, maybe a more uh, a pathological example, like uh, your mom calls and says, hey, my email's not working. Like, okay, mom, so when was the last time this was working? Uh, yesterday, you're still using Windows 95 on that broken-ass Packard Bell, and your computer's still plugged in, and your cable modem's still blinking, right? And we, we're, we're, all, we're all there. Uh, that's not the kind of thing that you'll probably have to do for most of your users, hopefully. But um, it's a good place to start to make sure that you've got that baseline. Uh, that you're not like, oh, but you fix this by entering this code. Oh, your monitor doesn't work. This is going to be a different kind of problem. Uh, this feeds into knowing your audience. Um, so my mom, I, I love her dearly. She's very smart. Uh, but I do not ask her about kernels. Um, I ask her about what her screen looks like if she calls me with computer problems. I don't say. What does it say? I say, what does it look like? Because uh, she's smart, but she's literal. And so if I say, what does it say? She'll say, well, it says 0xAB3. Uh, oh, is it blue, mom? Is it, is, oh, it's a blue screen of death. OK, you just need to turn it off and back on again. Uh, so make sure you pitch your, your uh, debugging if you're working with somebody else as your remote eyes and ears, which is generally the case for me. But uh, we'll get to some pure technology answers in, in a few minutes. Uh, so now that you know your audience, play to them. So uh, my mom probably wants her handheld and say, oh, no, no, that crashes like that happen all the time. Don't worry about it. It's not you. It's the computer. Uh, but developers using your API probably want just the facts. So, oh, hey, uh, what, what happened right before it broke? Or what is the exact error code and status message you're you know, receiving? Uh, tell, me, tell me exactly what happened. Uh, and uh, hopefully a developer will be able to cut and paste it instead of paraphrasing. And like, well, it says something about files. Like, oh, I bet it does. Um, <clears throat> this is also a, a good time to consider whether your audience uh, speaks English natively, so you can avoid idioms and euphemisms if not, uh, or has any other relevant conditions like, say, color blindness. So like that red line on the graph doesn't mean anything to you, does it? OK. Um, and knowing these things can pay some pretty sound rewards in the end and kind of resolution speed. And we're like, I'm not making some other assumptions about the kind of extended environment of uh, the person on the other end of the phone or the email. Um, for me, when people write in and, and ask for tech support, they usually say, hey, I am using you know, XYZ and Q is happening. But um, if they provide that, great. You know, make sure to take that into account. I, I train team members who are like, well, he, here's, here's the line. He says this is the error. I'm like, right, but let's read what he said first. He actually said this error happened all the time, and I just thought I'd mention it in addition to the fact that my machine's crashing now. Uh, so make sure you, you check all the background. And you know, if something is literally on fire, it might not make sense to ask, what led to this? It might make sense to ask, where's your fire extinguisher uh, as the first uh, line of troubleshooting. Um, but you know, still, it, it, unless it's on fire, it's <laughs> generally a good idea to, to get the background straight. And again, you know, state, your, state your assumptions, uh, suppositions, and like, get the customer, get the, the remote eyes to confirm that they're seeing what you imagine them seeing. <clears throat> uh, finally. Or, sorry, second to finally, uh, formulate your questions in a, uh, a way that's designed to call out relevant information. So this is the, the main thrust of Eric's talk is, you know, if you ask a question that says, it's broken, that's not even a question, right? But um, as, a, as a debugger, you might ask, what's wrong? And it's like, well, okay, uh, my ass hurts. Like, what? <laughs> okay, what's wrong with your software, man? Uh, so what on your screen looks wrong? Or maybe what on your screen led you to think that something's wrong with our software? Or maybe what on your screen led you to think that something's different uh, today about function Y of software X. 
Um, it's, it's a lot easier when you're working with something that you know really well, so your software. As a developer, you're like, hey, this guy's trying to use it. I know exactly what the failure modes are. Well, I've really never seen that before. He must be on a network in Zimbabwe or someplace we've never tested with. Um, <clears throat> versus, uh, hey, something seems wrong with my network. Are you sure you don't just have some malware that's hijacking all your browser sessions? Because your network seems fine to me. <clears throat> and then, uh, last but not least, uh, it's not on this list, uh, but um, this is where we have to go back to goals. Are we trying to get the problem solved in like three seconds? Like, turn it off and on again. We're done. Okay. But um, if, we're, if the problem we're trying to solve is a bigger problem, like, this guy writes in every week with trouble with using the API. Maybe we should try to get him off the API. Like, coding's not his strong point. Let's find him a GUI to use that, you know, he can get the same data. Um, and these, um, this is, a, you know, fed into by all the things we've already talked about, like uh, letting the audience explain the work they've already done to investigate the problem. And uh, some of the steps that uh, they might talk about might not be things you'd ask. You're like, oh, I didn't really care that you were on your laptop, except then it turns out this only happens on your laptop, so maybe it was more relevant than I thought that you're telling me about the fact that you're using your laptop to do this. And uh, worst case, uh, kind of letting people uh, spin a story if it's not going to take your whole afternoon is you figure out what their skill level is. So like, oh, this guy's talking about uh, you know memory protection and not about uh, you know blinking lights or something. You know, this uh, orders of magnitude less less clued. So that was kind of the the soft science of of uh, remote debugging. Uh, but uh, let's talk about tools because I imagine most of you guys, uh, as tech people, uh, are interested in like what can I use? Where does the where does the rubber meet the road, as it were? Um, <clears throat> so uh, while for my, my job, and presumably in your world, a lot of troubleshooting is having a computer ask another computer a question and kind of trying to interpret the answer. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I've got great uh, collective knowledge in the room, uh, from doing remote debugging with like GDB or using Nmap to map a network, uh, to using network level sniffers to say, oh, I just need to see the whole stream of data, and uh, there's a quote in there that shouldn't be in there. Uh, why you have to do that today is a, a different, uh, different talk about uh, data quality and uh, <laughs> easier debuggability. But, um, I want to go around the room, and you don't have to answer if you don't have one. Maybe just raise your hand if you do have one. Um, let's, uh, let's call out like, some of our favorite debugging tools, and we'll figure out a way to weave them together. I'll, I'll start with an example, and you guys can kind of follow on to that. Um, I don't know how many of you made it to uh, Greg's talk uh, downstairs earlier about S-Trace, but um, his, uh, that's one of my favorite tools. I, I just love, OK, hey, man, you're having trouble with this. Just run the same command with S-Trace in front of it and send me all that output. I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be a big chunk of output, so make sure you you know cut and paste it. Don't you know try to paraphrase it. Uh, it tells me stuff about you know okay, uh, it takes his it takes his computer an awful long time to open files. He's searching twelve thousand different paths for his libraries. There's something very funky in his LDE setup. Um, he's waiting a long time on locks. Uh, he gets a lot of you know failures on opening network sockets. Maybe his server's really busy. So that's that's why I like Estrace. Who else has a favorite tool they would like to shout out and why? What's up? Ah, <laughs> this is very handy for uh, <laughs> very handy if you have access to the code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the the network data is is huge these days, right? I mean, most of our data is is not on the standalone server unless you work for the NSA. And my friend tells me that even at the NSA, they have a network. You just do they just deny it? Except uh, in press releases, apparently. Yeah, log files are great. They, they, they're twofold, too, because you can watch it while it's running and say, ah, this is happening right now. And then after the thing crashes, you can say, hey, the last thing it did was uh, try to load 50 accounts. I don't think we ever tried that before. So yeah, log files are hugely valuable, not just for the app in question, but for the system. Hey, look, you ran out of file descriptors in the middle of doing that. No wonder everything else broke. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. The file system stores a lot of that metadata that can be super handy. Like, that library changed yesterday, man. No, no, I didn't. Yeah, it did. Go look at your cron jobs. I bet it updated in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, Matt, uh, Matt's trace route? Is it still called Matt's trace route or my trace route? <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's great, especially because that's a bi-directional thing. You can say, ah, this is what it looks like to me. What does it look like to you? Um, which is a source of never-ending consternation and in internet support. Uh, something I forgot to ask uh, before we started, if anybody with their laptop open feels motivated and wanted to write a list of these down um, that we've been talking about, there is an etherpad. Oh, I don't get a pen. Um, there's an etherpad that's linked to from the session notes link for this session uh, on the OS Bridge site. Um, and the, we just make a list of like, the things that we've mentioned because I, I want to go back and uh, read more about Wireshark, which I've actually never used. I'm still living in the days of TCP dump, and you could probably use a refresher. <clears throat> um, let me uh, show you a real quick demo. I, I, 
this is not a, supposed to be a dog and pony show, but uh, my favorite tool uh, is actually the tool that my company writes. And uh, the reason it's my favorite is because it, it kind of synthesizes a lot of the best practices that, um, that a lot of tools have. So this is a real app that's running on our servers uh, in a data center in Chicago. Uh, it serves about 560,000 uh, requests per minute. What's that? Oh, shoot. How do I get that over there? Mm, there we go. Hmm. Maybe I can mirror display somehow. Maybe I'll just turn around and face the other way. Ah! Hadn't occurred to me you weren't going to all be sitting behind me staring over my shoulder. Look at this laptop. Hmm. All right, so this is a high level view of our, um, <laughs> not that high level, but a high level view of our, uh, of our app that um, is serving something like 500,000 requests per minute. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is the real data from yesterday. And we can see that around uh, hmm, late in the day on 618, uh, there was a big spike in response time. And uh, this, these graphs just tie a lot of stuff together. We can see that, okay, the, um, this graph is about throughput. And we can see the throughput was pretty spiky right at the time that the response time was pretty spiky. This is in milliseconds, so two seconds at the top and 500 milliseconds is way above average. Um, we can also see that all the servers involved in this pool had basically the same performance. They were all serving the same number of requests. Our load balancer was working, round robin, yay. Uh, nobody had really excessive uh, CPU or memory usage during this time, or at least it was all pretty consistent. Let's look at a little graph to see what, <coughs> if there was any spikes. No, really do it. There are certainly spikes, but they happen on every server. So we can, we can assume this is probably not a server-specific problem. Uh, some other things we can see is that, ah, right around here, there were a lot of errors. Let's go look at what the errors were. And this, is a, this tool is nice because it, it kind of uh, collates a lot of information that you would have to go digging in application server logs and in you know, whatever the monitor that, that actually monitors your response time and it monitors, monitors how busy your server was. So uh, we can see there were a fair number of errors. There were most of them were uh, 503 errors, which I happen to know are, are transient errors on our side, but they're all with this uh, data collector that's uh, mobile. And it's an order of magnitude more than any other, uh, other error. So we can just say, oh, maybe there were really crappy uh, throughput rates on, uh, on mobile networks yesterday. Let's, let's go uh, find out if that was the case. Uh, our software also takes a kind of trace of any slow transactions. And we can just go look at some of what the slowest ones were during this time. Hmm, no, these aren't about uh, mobile at all. Interesting. Inside the transaction specific view, we kind of get a, a view of what's doing what. And oh, OK, it was entirely reading this uh, payload. Every, if you get rid of that, nothing, there was no other time in this request. So somehow the network send was just being slow. And if, if I have this installed in a customer system, and he writes in and says, hey, why was my website slow at 2 PM yesterday, I can just go dig in and tell him, oh, well, your one server finally ran out of CPU as this trend has been going up for the last three weeks. Or your CPU was fine because there was no upward trend. There was no spike. There's something else going on. Maybe your load balancer failed or you had a, a bad network connection. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about some of these tools and categories. Um, uh, <clears throat> starting with uh, like the remote probe, so Nmap, Traceroute, things I can do from my place to yours without necessarily involving you. Um, in that category, um, yeah, I guess Traceroute is the other one. Um, local probing, uh, user's browser, uh, things like Top or Process Explorer. Uh, passive observers, uh, network sniffers that, that you know, won't change anything, but like, oh, you can go gather logs for me for a minute from your network traffic and then send them and <laughs> your app will keep doing its thing. Uh, things like for at runtime, like strace or uh, debug logs. Uh, compile time, lint, I mean, these days our problem is usually not type safety by the time we get to remote debugging. That's usually a local debugging issue, but at the same time, uh, we haven't changed from 64 to 128 bit as native yet, so who knows what happens when the Cisco switches all get upgraded and our apps are still talking 64 bit. Uh, ints. Uh, post crash, uh, again, debug log, something like GDB against a core file. And uh, nobody here fessed up to being a doctor or anything. I'm, I'm curious, like, you know. What category does a thermometer go in? Like, it's kind of a local probe. Um, it's, it's certainly a runtime. If it's, if it's post-crash, you probably missed your, uh, you know, your window. Like, yep, he's, he's dead, Jim. We can tell from the thermometer. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, and can we synthesize some best practices from, from that? Like, um, I'd like to say that like, it's super easy if you got your own network that you got set up on while everything was calm and quiet and behaving normally. You've, you've got kind of you know, some, some baselines for, uh, oops, for what things should look like uh, normally as opposed to what they happen to look like just right now. So let's get a long-term trend real quick. And we can see that generally, like, the response time is way under 200 milliseconds. And uh, perhaps some of our uh, load problems are related to this whole uh, climb from uh, this whole double in uh, traffic in the last month. I, I don't know. Um, so, but if you, this is only useful if you really have your own shop that's already set up. But if you're like me, you get called in when something's on fire and people have installed things after the fact, if at all, like, oh, hey, so it's broken now. Well, what did fixed look like? What, you know? If you don't have uh, you know, some Zabbix or, or Cacti graphs to go back and refer to and say, oh, yeah, this whole month, uh, you know, connection numbers have been climbing and uh, response time and swap usage has been growing. And oh my gosh, um, what can you even do? <clears throat> uh, this, is, this is where I'm hoping for a little, little bit of feedback. What kind of, uh, kind of tactics do you use? I don't know if any of you are consultants or get called in to like, mom's computer is broken now, but it wasn't yesterday. What do, you, what do you do after the fact? What, what is your forensic toolkit for, for debugging? And especially, what is the toolkit you can use when you're not there at mom's house? You're like, OK, I would fire up you know, a, a rescue disk and start scrubbing the file system. Mom would be like, well, I turned it off and on again. Um, any ideas, thoughts? I didn't really lead you into that one very well. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> well, maybe we'll talk about that again at the end. Um, I think the most fun part of this talk is not all the stuff that I've just sat up here and, and preached at you, but uh, the kind of the stories that people come to while they're debugging things. And that's the hook that I think I used to get you in the door was like, oh, what happens if you're in Antarctica and you have to phone in a surgery? Uh, so that actually turned out to be an, an urban legend I'd, I'd misheard. Uh, what happens is you're a Russian doctor named uh, Leonid Rogozov in, uh, at, at South Pole with uh, 12 of your comrades in the 1950s, and you get appendicitis, and there's no other doctors there. And you realize that you have to perform surgery on yourself. And so you uh, get your buddies to hand you scalpels and kind of slap you about the face when you pass out so you can keep cutting it out. And, and you survive. And you live for another 40 years somehow. Um, but there are some better stories of remote debugging. You know, OK, you have the whole world at your disposal because you're an astronaut. And you're talking to ground control. And something goes wrong. So uh, last year, the, uh, the Inter International Space Station had a, a failure as one of its power distribution units. It has four things called the main bus switching units. I don't know why they call all four of them the main bus switching units, but um, it is not a redundant thing. It is a um, if we're at capacity, we're using all of them thing. So uh, one of them was still working, but was no longer reporting to the telemetry systems. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm processing this much power, doing this with it. And uh, ground control is like, oh, shit, if we don't fix it right now and something else breaks, then you guys are all going to come home real fast and not in the way that you will leave you alive. So uh, they go out in a spacewalk, and they're like, oh, well, this is just like doing you know, healthcare at 24,000 feet altitude. The answer is don't do it outside. Bring it into like, a controlled environment. Um, and so they said, OK, well, we've got an extra one of these things, so we'll just mount that and bring the other one back in and fix it. And they try to mount the new one, and it won't mount. And they're kind of staring at it through their big face shields with their big gloves, and they realize that there's filings trapped in the threads of the, the bolt receiver. And they can't fit their fat fingers in there to get them out. And they might not want to anyway, because you poke a tiny hole in your space glove, and you not a very comfortable experience. So uh, they, they call ground control, and they're like, hey, what do we do about this? You know, the canned air isn't working so well out here. And you know, we don't really have a you know, handy little brush with us. And ground control says, oh, we'll, we'll get back to you. Come inside and, and hang out for a minute. So uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the astronauts go inside, and the ground control starts thinking, like, what do we have in this? Uh, in the space station, like they can't, we can't send them anything. They can't go to the hardware store. Like, okay, we got some wire and we got a toothbrush. So they strapped some wire and a toothbrush together and realized that the two brands of toothbrushes, the the cheap and Russian knockoff ones, were actually better than the American ones. So the you know, American guys went next door and knocked and said, "Hey, could we borrow it? Actually, could you just have a toothbrush? We're going to ruin it." And uh, they uh, chopped off the handle and bound the wire to it. And then the uh, ground control guy said, "Well, what happens in, you know, the vacuum of space to this toothbrush? Is it is it going to be, you know, is it just shatter because it's." 300 degrees colder than it has been ever before. And it turned out, no, it wouldn't. So they uh, took the toothbrush solution out there and scrubbed out the bolts and got the thing bolted back in. And uh, the astronauts probably would have come up with that solution eventually because they had a pretty limited you know, toolbox. I mean, we see everything we have. It's right here. But um, 
I, I think that uh, examples like that are pretty illustrative of like how how can you debug when you're not there successfully. Um, does anybody have any stories like that they'd like to share? I was really hoping to, yeah, bring it. <laughs> you know, and, and I can look at the, I can blow up the icons and say, oh yeah, that's the network one, and you know, that kind of thing. So I find that to be a, a great asset. Another thing you might find out we are in there is that they've never dusted, and maybe that's a, a good thing to do before they call you about it. It's on fire, literally. <laughs> he, he and I have had some of the same clients. <laughs> How did you debug that? I mean, was it, <laughs> I smell something, perhaps is a server on fire? <laughs> When the sprinklers came on, you figured it out? Uh, <laughs> it was already on. Ah. Well, let that be a lesson to you guys. Don't use hot plug SCSI anymore. <laughs> At all. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> there are the, um, those switches that have um, serial port uh, interfaces. Yeah. We've got, had to use those in the past when you've got, you can't get a network connection <laughs> itself, but you know you can get the console. <laughs> I've broken it in such a way that I can't access it except by plugging in. <laughs> yeah. um, there's the, the home machines, those, <coughs> I can't remember what they're called. There are a bunch of different like equivalent home VNC uh, style things where these days you can literally Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a bunch of projects out there that Fogcrete, Fogcrete's Copilot is the one we use at work, but there's uh, you know WebEx, all those. But uh, those are great tools for mom too because I'm like I can't see what you're seeing, mom. I understand that your icons are messed up, but I need a little bit better context than that. Um, and those are tools that require kind of like zero conf on the user side, so it's, it can be nice when you're like, ah, okay, you have five minutes to fix this. It takes one minute to fire that up, and then we have four minutes to address the problem instead of you know. Five minutes of how am I even going to see what you're seeing? Can you just point your camera phone at your screen? Uh, not the best uh, debugging tool. One of the things we found useful for we have clients who have half a dozen or a dozen workstations are using for graphics and using for game processing images that they put on the website. And there used to be Windows that we've switched for their Linux and the Windows software they have to run and run the virtual machine. Well, all the virtual machines will run on any of their workstations. So if they have a problem, go to the other one and run the same one. If the problem runs over and run away, they just go through a box. <laughs> have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> the box is kind of be able to be plug and play, then we quickly tell which one it is. So at least then we worry about that box. Yeah, great. Yeah. Again, it's nice to have like copious resources that you've set up beforehand because it's a little hard to debug that in the heat of the moment of like, well, we're in the middle of getting this guy's X-rays and the thing broke and we only have the one X-ray machine. <laughs> Oh, you didn't type sudo first, mom. <laughs> Do you uh, have you found auto SSH to be stable? It's it's funny because I've I've tried to use that before and I actually ended up having to fire up like eight different tunnels because seven of them would fail and I'd be like, uh, the last one to my home cable modem. It just it, it would get stuck in this like twenty minute wait cycle. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, it worked really well for me for about a month and this uh, shared client that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that was the idea that it was supposed to work that way. I don't know how I managed to break this uh, fail safe piece of software, but it was a good tool when it worked. Uh, an alternative that I found very reliable is uh, uh, OpenVPN, uh, either, either for a Linux or a Windows system. You have it start whenever they, they fire up the machine and it, it connects into my server, so I log that out, the route, and then I can use remote desktop or VMC or, or whatever. Yeah. 
and you can see that it rebooted three times yesterday. Hmm, <laughs> who's been tripping around in the machine room? Um, so, uh, <clears throat> I think I got about five minutes left. Is that true, Stephanie? I got 15 minutes left. I'm looking at the wrong number on there. Um, so, uh, I guess uh, one uh, kind of useful to me uh, remote troubleshooting technique that I'm going to talk about is um, a, a lot of our customers have trouble getting their, their servers, which are in a data center somewhere, which don't normally talk to the internet, to, to talk to our servers, because we collate all the data on our end, um, the things that build the graphs that I was showing you earlier. And there's a surprising number of uh, really competent IT people who are like, well, my whole world lives in this data center, and I'm sure that the connectivity between my server and the database server is great, because I can see that queries are flowing, yay, life is good, but I can't talk to your servers. Like, oh, okay, well, there's a, there's a firewall or proxy in the way. Like, I don't, I don't think so. I've never needed to set anything for a firewall or proxy. Like, right, because you don't leave your network. And uh, it can be sometimes uh, maddening to get people to actually tell you the status of their settings if they can even find them. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite techniques is like, hey, just fire for browser on that server and, and go to a status page on our site. And if you can get there, then, oh, you know that your firewall is letting you through. And, oh, you know you don't need a proxy. Or you know your system is at least configured to use a proxy by default, which we should pick up the same proxy settings. Or if we don't, then, hey, look, there's a bug. Um, that's, that's a pretty frequent problem I have. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it also often bespeaks like, oh, your Internet Explorer is so old it does not, in fact, use the system key store. So it's working because you've imported the keys for our SSL certificate over there, but not uh, into your system. Um, okay, let's um, I didn't really get enough out of you guys during the, like, uh, uh, brainstorm some uh, categories of things that work well together. So say someone dropped you on the moon. Uh, and you got the, got the moon network and computers, you don't have any idea of the operating system or networking uh, protocol in use. Do you have any, any thoughts as to how you'd go about, like, uh, someone tells you the moon network is broken. And you're like, well, I know nothing about any of this. Uh, at least the computers seem to speak English. What, what kind of, like, uh, you know, first, first shots in the dark would you take? Like, how do we demonstrate the problem? How do we, you know, further define the problem? Any thoughts? Brian? Ah, well, he told me it's broken, so you ask for more details about why? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, you know, get, ask the smart questions, get, get the customer, get the audience to tell you why, you know, what is, what is the perception that it make, makes you think that something is wrong? And uh, this is one of my favorite interview questions, too, is like, so, something's wrong, what do you do? And they're like, well, what do you mean? Like, what do you do? Like, you know, your mom calls you and just all she's doing is heavy breathing. Like, do you, do you just say, oh, probably nothing there and just hang up? You try to elucidate a response, right? So um, uh, some of my favorite answers have been people who totally go off on a tangent that's not w about what's wrong, but that il illustrate a lot of domain expertise. Like, oh, uh, something's wrong. Well, uh, you know, is the building on fire? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check the fire alarms. Like, well, it's probably a good first, like, low-level response, you know, better than, like, you know, is, uh, d does your ear itch? You know, like, as far as, like, oh, this one's really important. This one could probably wait a while. Uh, another thing people often do is, is wander way off into the weeds, like, oh, well, my question was actually going to be, do you know how to use Google to solve this problem? You know, eventually, I want you to, find, to elucid, elucid, elicit for me an error code or an error message that, uh, um, that I could then go Google and say, oh, well, somebody else has had this problem, and on Stack Overflow, they said that X was the solution, or at least Y was a probable cause. Uh, but it's kind of neat to hear people explain to me how DNS works in the middle of, like, well... <laughs> If it's not working, then probably, uh, yeah, let's see. So the name server is not supporting recursion. I'm like, oh, well, you actually passed, although not in the traditional way, because you demonstrated enough you know, domain expertise and uh, technical competence to, you know, get me to, get me to shut up. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to open it to questions in about uh, two minutes. But uh, I'll try to kind of tie together some of the stuff I've, I've mentioned. And I hope it hasn't bored you, because I'm kind of hammering on some of the same themes. But I think they're really important. That if you, um, you know, if you don't ask good questions, you don't figure out what is wrong in the world before you start trying to debug, you're not going to come to an answer that's useful to anybody. You might find that, oh, yeah, you know, that guy never ran Windows Update, but that actually wasn't the source of his problem. Source of a lot of other problems, but, and, you know, if you're a doctor, then, hey, you're going to fix the patient, not the, the problem. But uh, in our world, there's probably enough questions that we want to focus on the actual, like, the problems that we... Uh, are in some sense responsible for, at least are getting in the way of people paying us for our services or, or using our, our software. Um, but uh, in that vein, a lot of those uh, 
best debugging practices do require the foresight or the, the kind of the history that you don't necessarily have, but that you can install tools that will have. You know, oh, okay, how fast does your site usually load? Fast isn't an answer. You know, five seconds is an answer. And let's see, like, is it five seconds once when you tried it last week, or has it been five seconds for the last three months and it just changed today? Um, your cacti graphs have months of data, and you've learned how to deal with all those blips in service before a major outage occurs, instead of like in the, uh, you know, something's on fire, oh crap. Um, <clears throat> the, the real unfortunate thing is that a lot of times, by the time the network's broken, it's kind of hard to get new tools in there. So um, one of my, uh, if, <laughs> back when I was a consultant, which thank goodness I'm not anymore, uh, one of my favorite things to do was just to bring a USB key with every single piece of uh, software, both in, you know, x86 binary and in source form, like, okay, I, I'm going to want to build MTR and see what, exactly what's going on, and I may not be able to get it at the customer site, so I better have it with me already. Oh, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and bring every single GCC package I've ever seen, just in case they have no compilers. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's, that's actually about uh, all I've got. Um, if you guys have any questions, I don't know, I didn't think I said anything groundbreaking, but, uh, you know, hopefully informed your style a little bit, and... Uh, you know, next time you ask somebody a question, it'll be one question instead of ten, and you'll fix their problem in five minutes instead of an hour, because I don't necessarily rate quickness as my number one goal, but it sure is nice when it's that easy. Questions? So what do you do for repeat questions? <laughs> uh, so Pete and repeat sat in a boat. Exactly. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks for your attention, and uh, I'll be around all week.